whether they live or die. With your help, we could convince them that with a little extra effort on their part... I want to say something. There's this song I used to sing in the orphanage when I'd get sad. It always cheers me. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Chappelle. Uh, during the civil rights movement, uh, the, I can't, I can't read what's on the teleprompter. <laughs> Some <laughs> about black America and white America. <laughs> there's black Americans and there's white Americans. We're all one America. So, so if you don't mind, this is a, this is not live, is it? I imagine whatever I say, you could just you could just edit it out. Let's try it a few ways. Lou, are you in the booth? I am. All right, good. Uh, you know what, Lou? Let's just play around with it and see if we can get it right. Get this clip package on, and then, and then let me go home. All right? You got it. All right. Ready? All right. Count me in. Five, four, three, two, one. Wu Tang. I'm just with you, Lou. Let's do it again. <laughs> We're gonna do it again. We'll get it right. Here we go, dude. Five, four, three, two. You know, when I was a comedian starting out in Washington, D.C., right here in this city, 1988, I'll never forget this, it was a comedy club owner that banned profanity from his comedy club. He said it offended his audience, and this was a, a cause of major concern for all the comedians in the circuit. And we all called a meeting, and we had the owners come, and it was the club owners, and it was the comedians. It was the classic labor dispute. <laughs> the club owners laid out their case. There cannot be profanity in these clubs, because that offends people. And there's a comedian who's still a good friend of mine to this day. He was right here in Washington, D.C. He stood up. And he said, he's black, I should tell you, because it's important to the story. <laughs> he says, I use profanity because I live a profane lifestyle. <laughs> he says, I don't have an insect infestation in my house. I have roaches. <laughs> And the music they make is your laughter. And that's the laughter that I score my entire life to. So now, some of my favorite American comedic composers. Thank you. Sometimes I wish I was a dog, but he was a tree. <laughs> when you stop and think, football is a fair sport for my people. Only sport in the world, a Negro can chase a white man and 40,000 people stand up and cheer. <laughs> See, in my neighborhood, the kids have a kind of a dubious reaction to that whole Santa Claus concept. They just don't believe that a white man will ride a reindeer through Harlem after midnight. <laughs> In truth, white friend, it's you that all look alike. <laughs> but look at the black people around you. We're all different colors. Black walnut, burnt out almond, <laughs> chocolate, chocolate mocha, pecan, vanilla, yellow, mellow, light, bright, and damn near white. We come from the first people on the earth. <laughs> you know, the first people on the earth were black people. We the first people had thought. Right? We was the first one to say, where the am I? <laughs> and how do you get to Detroit?
Janelle Monet. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, you ladies are right. To be honest with you, your lives look terrifying to me. They do, man. I know nothing about being a woman, but I know fear. Yo, I used to live in New York when I was 17, and I couldn't even pay my bills. You know what I did to make money? I used to do shows for drug dealers that wanted to clean their money up. And one time I did a real good set, and these motherfuckers called me in the back room. They gave me $25,000 in cash. I was probably 18 or 19 years old. I'm scared. I thanked them profusely. I put that money in my backpack. I jumped on the subway and started heading towards Brooklyn at 1 o'clock in the morning. Never been that terrified in my life. Because I'd never in my life had something that somebody else would want. I thought to myself, Jesus Christ, if motherfuckers knew how much money I had in this backpack, they'd kill me for it. And then I thought, holy shit. What if I had a pussy on me all the time? <laughs> That's what women are dealing with. I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> it's real talk. If them same drug dealers gave me a pussy and said, put this in your backpack and take it to Brooklyn, I'd be like, nigga, I can't accept this. <laughs> I empathize, man, you know. Everybody gets mad because I say these jokes. But you understand that this is the best time to say them. More now than ever. And I know there's some comedians in the back. Motherfucker, you have a responsibility to speak recklessly. Otherwise. <laughs> New York Times said uh, that Louis C.K. jizzed on his own stomach. <laughs> You know, I've busted a lot of nuts in my day. None of them were newsworthy. <laughs> Shit was really gross. Because they didn't just say it like I said it. They didn't just say jizz on the stomach. They said it in that fucking Pulitzer Prize winning style that the New York Times has. It was very descriptive. Like, you know what I mean? Louis C.K.'s semen shot out like a volcano of misogyny. <laughs> Slowly drizzling down like lava, <laughs> covering his freckled penis as it slowly dripped to a fiery crown of red hair. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ, I'm trying to eat some Wavell's Rancheros, and these niggas. Is... <laughs> and you know, the tough part being a comedian and knowing the motherfuckers. Everybody comes up to me like, did you know? Did you know what Louie was doing? No, bitch, I did not know. <laughs> the fuck you think we talk about at the comedy club? Hey, nigga, how was the weekend? Great, man. I was just jerking off and faces and coming on my own stomach, having a good time. You know how this business is. No, I didn't know. They act like we sit around like grease. Tell me more, tell me more. Did she put up a fight? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know the choreography, but you get the point. You get the point. <laughs> she was intense. But Louis was like the turning point. I mean, you know, I, all these allegations are terrible. Louis was the only... <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but fuck it. His, his allegation was the only one that made me, like, laugh. <laughs> well, if you think about it... <laughs> All his friends is reading it and he's jerking off and he's surprising people. He's surprising me. <laughs> <laughs> That's picture all the comics and comedy just reading it like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. I know it's terrible. I'm sorry, ladies. You're right. You are right. But at the same time, I mean, you know what I mean? I don't know. Jesus Christ, they took everything from Louis. I was like, I don't know, it might be disproportionate. I can't tell. I can't tell. This is like where it's hard to be a man. One lady said, Louis C.K. masturbating in front of me ruined my comedy dreams. Word. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, then I dare say, madam, you may have never had a dream. Come on, man, that's a brittle spirit. <laughs> that is a brittle ass spirit, nigga. That shit is too much. This is a grown ass woman. You know what this shit is like? It's like COINTELPRO. You know what that is? It's a program that the oh, FBI no. had on the Jagger Hoover. And this program, one of the many things they did was they would track the sexual habits of anyone they considered an enemy of the state. It was a lip button. That's why they got all these fucking sex tapes with Martin Luther King fucking bitches. But lucky for us, he actually had a dream. <laughs> you think if Louis C.K. jerked off in front of Dr. King, he'd be like, I can't continue this movement. I'm sorry, but the freedom of black people must be stopped. I didn't know this nigga was going to pull his dick out and jerk off like this. I just thought we were going to get a couple of drinks and chill. <laughs> Show business is just harder than that. The women are sounding like, I hate to say it, y'all, they're sounding weak. I know it sounds fucked up, I'm not supposed to say that, but one of these ladies was like, Louis C.K. was masturbating while I was on the phone with him. Bitch, you don't know how to hang up a phone? How the fuck are you going to survive in show business if this is an actual obstacle to your dreams? I know Louis is wrong, ma'am. I'm just saying I'm held to a higher standard of accountability than these women are. Don't forget who I am. Don't forget what I am. I am a black dude. All these movements, not to get deep, all these movements probably start, not even the 60s, all this shit started in 1945. That's when America just fucking lost its mind. It was after that Second World War. Think about it. Because black Americans went off and fought in the war. They went to Europe, they made more money than they ever made in America. They might even got their dick sucked by white women. <laughs> and then they came back to the United States and they looked around and they said, you know what? I don't like the way I'm being treated around here. <laughs> but it wasn't just black dudes. At the same time, all the women in America went into the workforce because all the men were gone. That's when you see that old poster in the 40s with that dyke, like, we can do it. <laughs> that's where that's from. And these women made money, and then the dudes came back home and started telling these women what to do, and they were like, yo, I'm not feeling you, nigga. <laughs> At the same time, the CIA started experimenting with a drug in San Francisco. Back then, nobody knew about it, called LSD. By 1960, all the white kids in America were like, it works. <laughs> and a new school of thought was unleashed on the American consciousness. People had never even thought like that before, and now they were thinking like that in mass. White kids in mass were like, fuck our parents' plans for us. <laughs> By the time 1960 rolled around, the President of the United States was 42 years old. He was the next best hope. And they blew his brains out in Dallas in fucking parade. That's the most gangster shit. There were eight major assassinations in the 60s. Kennedy, Kennedy, X, King, Everts. And then, by the 70s, the white youth culture and the Black Panthers and the black youth culture started to merge. He started to see Timothy Leary meeting Eldridge Cleaver in Africa, not Oakland. <laughs> and that was the beginning of the 70s, one of the most turbulent decades this nation has ever seen. And I say all that to say this, that in that turbulent historical context, Bill Cosby raped 34 people. <laughs> TV, I saw another old woman describing one of these antique rapes. <laughs> these rapes were old school. They're like, and then Bill Cosby pulled my bloomers down. Bloomers? Let's start our game. My gods are the art killers. I've heard lots of people 
Jews say once a man's a killer, they just keep on killing and killing. They sort of develop a taste. You have the right to kill one man or kill ten. It's all so empty and hot for all. That's all they said. I said these people are obviously trying to destroy Dr. Cosby's rich legacy. <laughs> 34 allegations later, I was still like, man, they probably only raped 13 or 14 of those people. <laughs> Do all that raping. <laughs> it's like 50 fucking rapes. And don't forget, each one of these rapes have eight hours of sleep in them. It's like a thousand hours of rape. <laughs> Packed into an otherwise busy schedule. <laughs> Short corporate rapes, that's what I support. <laughs> Why would they sleep? That's what I don't understand. Why Bill Cosby making all these girls sleep? Like, look, man, I'm not even as famous as Bill Cosby was, but I know 20 girls I could call right now and be like, yo, come on to my place for a drink. And I'm gonna put something in it, and you're gonna fall asleep, and I'm gonna fuck you while you're sleeping. And they'd be like, cool, nigga, cool. <laughs> what time are you gonna come over? Wait. Is that a train here, that train? <laughs> Trains do something to black people. Don't you feel like running for that train? <laughs> I've never been in a situation where I needed to be something about being black, nigga. You just when you hear a train once you're like, I've gotta go. <laughs> just wanna run away. <laughs> no, man, for real. This is not it's not comfortable like it used to be. I don't know how transgender people beat black people in the discrimination Olympics. If the cops shot this many trannies, you'd be like, it's a goddamn conspiracy. Right. <laughs> 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 Niggas gonna stop wearing high heels just to feel safe. <laughs> <laughs> Problem officer? <laughs> California where the lady got beat up in traffic. You see that shit on YouTube? And they beat the shit out of it. You watch the tape, you be like, what is How did he do, do that? That's Turns called a headshot. headshot. But his name is good news is the city of LA decided to court should award her $1.5 million for pain and suffering. Which, if you know anything about money, is as much Marcos Maidana made to fight Floyd Mayweather the second time. <laughs> It's pretty good considering this woman never trained a day in her life. You can see it in the tape, she didn't come to fight. She took too many shots. She got her cover her gut, punch her face, she just wasn't doing it right. What, what? You know what's funny about being in San Francisco? First of all, the city's not even gay anymore. Gay people can't afford to live there. They just visit. Gay people got their money tied up in other shenanigans. Where you from, bro? Where? Canada? Well, all right, you can get off the watch list. You know, America has a racial hot seat, which belongs to black Americans, but I know you sat in it for a while. I can honestly say Arabs and Mexicans sat in that seat. And we, the black Americans, would like to thank you both for your sacrifice and your struggle. Everybody goes through something, but at least I can leave my backpack someplace. You leave your backpack, you got 20 minutes to find that shit. Before they send a robot to blow your luggage up. Don't you remember San Francisco when that motherfucking tiger jumped out of the cage and bit those people up? And San Francisco is so gay, the whole city blamed the tiger. 
No, they blamed the victims. They didn't even say shit about the tiger. They said these people were teasing that tiger. That's irrelevant. <laughs> tiger should not be able to jump out of the cage and kill people at the zoo. They said that that tiger chased one of his victims 400 yards. Listen, you know how fucking fast you have to run to outrun a tiger for 400 yards? He probably woke up in the hospital with an NFL recruiter standing over his bed. You did good, son. You did very good. I know this isn't a good time, but I'm with the uh, Cincinnati Bengals. Complete coincidence. I think we can tie something in, do something really big with you. One of the guys the tiger bit was Mexican, and the other two were Arabs. I said, what a, who trained this tiger? Homeland Security, like everybody? I gave that tiger some beans. You smell those beans? You can smell that? Go get them. There's some curry. I see a lot of Indians in San Francisco. I always wanted to be in a Bollywood movie. Because Bollywood movies are deep, but at the end of the movie, no matter what kind of movie it is, there's always a dance number to make you feel better when you go home. Even if it's precious. <laughs> at the end of the movie, precious would just jump out of the coffin. I don't have AIDS. <laughs> You ever see Precious? Boy, that was a sad movie. Yeah, that was tough. If you haven't seen it, you know all the statistics of living in urban life in America. But if you could picture all those statistics happening to one person for 90 minutes, that was Precious. Life through the book of that fat bitch. And... The music haunted me. Because the music was like... You know, like, I don't know, break beats or something. If they had Eddie Vedder do the score for Precious, I'd have killed myself in the movie theater. If they had some of that, like, smashing punches. Just, Precious was morbidly obese. She couldn't read good. She was a victim of incest and the baby had Down syndrome. Still the first verse, nigga. You gotta see the movie. <laughs> she caught AIDS at the end. She might have had it the whole movie, but at the end she found it. <laughs> That's one way to lose weight, you know. <laughs> fucking movie, Precious is a fictitious character. I'm sorry. It's a fucked up movie. It was a fucked up movie. <laughs> I got scared when I went to see Straight Outta Compton and Easy e caught AIDS at the end. That shit freaked me out. Because I didn't know you could get AIDS from firing your manager. <laughs> you didn't see Straight Outta Compton. Easy E caught AIDS in the last 10 minutes of the movie. He just started. <coughs> <coughs> you good, nigga? You all right? Yeah, I'm good. <coughs> <laughs> Who catches AIDS like that? <coughs> <coughs> AIDS does not sound like that. It's a racking cough. <laughs> And AIDS weird that a disease came out of nowhere in the 80s that doesn't kill anybody but niggas, fags, and junkies. <laughs> what kind of disease hates everybody that old white people hate? <laughs> I think the government hid that shit in disco balls. <laughs> Only fun people get AIDS. <laughs> you never see that guy. Think I'm gonna stay home and read a book. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I think I'm gonna just go stay home and cook for myself. <coughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Remember when Donald Sterling made that tape? 
said all those bad things about black people. That tape was fucked up. But that goes to show everybody, if you get old and white and racist in America, whatever you do, don't tell your black girlfriend about that shit because that's who made the tape. She taped everything. The tape was embarrassing. He was like, stop bringing these black guys to my games. We were all listening like, well, how you gonna have a game without us? <laughs> There'll be a lot of bounce passes and layups in this shit. <laughs> and then it turned out the black guy he was speaking of was none other than Magic Johnson, NBA legend, and billionaire. Unfucking believable. Didn't even mention the fact that he had AIDS, which is the first thing I would say to my girlfriend. <laughs> this guy must be very racist if AIDS is the footnote. <laughs> How many of y'all work for Google? Nobody? <laughs> Thanks, Fuse. That air horn always pushes the joke through. You ever do something regular, but if you do it with the air horn, it sounds better. Like once I pulled my dick out at a New Year's Eve party. Real traumatic experience. I'd been drinking. It's really fucked up. I had to make all new friends. I did it on the 10 count. The motherfucker was like, six, five. And I was saying to myself, what if I pull my dick out? He said, three. And then I looked down and said, oh no, it's out. <laughs> and an air horn pushed me over the top. I pulled that shit out. I was like, oh! Man, when that nigga pulled his dick out, that really set the party off. 